African clubs are okay. Middle Eastern clubs are okay. But if you create a white club, you're called a Nazi. And you know that that's how it works. This is how they silence you. But you can't be silenced anymore. I recommend you stand up before they push you to your knees and cut your head off verbally and every other way. That's my opinion. And so we'll talk about that because the white students' unions are saying all they want is equality. They're not out to antagonize anyone. They're not out to put anyone down. But they said they just want equality. They are fed up with being marginalized on campuses. And they believe that they have a lot of pride in what their ancestors have brought to the world. And so uh, students of European descent are creating so-called white student unions. It's an interesting topic to discuss. And as you can expect, the racists are going to call them Nazis. This is how it works. That's the game that they play. Let's go back to the first question of what happened to Seoul in America. Gerald, you'll be the last caller of this hour from KSFO in San Francisco. Fire away. Yes, yeah, 73 years old, calling from zombie land in the Tenderloin, San Francisco, California. Doctor, the soul was always there, but it has been absolutely numbed by drugs, starting with marijuana, antidepressants, and anxiety drugs, etc., etc., etc. They've just numbed it. Does that is that true in the in the music community as well? I think it's a false soul. They think that they feel feel soul, but it's a distorted soul that has no religion to it, no values to it. Interesting. Wow. Well, you're calling from deep in the heart of uh, the Tenderloin, which is very interesting unto itself that uh, you'd be listening to my program down there, Geraldo. Stay on the line. I'm sending you a copy of Government Zero from the Join Sa the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Warning. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Uh, forget about it. Okay, let's move on. You can't blame the average person. Their, their brains have shut down. It's not that they're stupid. It's not that the average person is stupid. They know that every politician lies through their teeth. They trust nobody. There's no authority left in the country to trust. So they go in their own direction, whatever they have to do. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, alcohol, stupid movies, shopping like morons, eating like idiots, stuffing their face, their ears, and so they're deadening their soul because it goes back to what I'm saying, what happened to soul in America. In this hour, we're going to talk about the lying Paris Global Warming Conference with an expert on the subject, William Briggs, who has been with us before. And he's going to show you how it's basically run by liars and thieves at this conference. And we'll have that in this hour. You can judge for yourself and see whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Look, I got nothing at stake in this. Here's the funny part about it. You say, oh, I'm working for Exxon. I'm not working for Exxon. I don't even own oil stock, incidentally. I am a trained... Okay, let's start again. I have a doctorate in nutrition, epidemiology, and medical anthropology. Let's be specific. From one of America's greatest universities at the time, with more Nobel Prize winners, not myself, more Nobel Prize winners at the time than any university in the country, I'm proud to say, 1978, the University of California at Berkeley. But prior to that, I earned a master's degree in ethnobotany, which was a pioneering field at the time, and my master's thesis was published in its entirety in a journal at Harvard University, which is a great honor for those of you who know academia. I also earned a master's degree in anthropology. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because my whole life I've been a truth seeker. And so when I get back into the world of politics, I use the same analytical mind or viewpoint that I use in all of my other endeavors. And so I really don't care which way the truth falls. So when I say to you, from, from my point of view, this whole thing about the, the Paris Global Warming Conference, it's a scam. It's a scam. I told you it was about a world tax. Obama said it was a world tax today. It's a method of robbing from the middle class to give not to the poor, as that gangster says, but to kick the money up to the trillionaires who are running the scam. Do I have to go any farther than San Francisco itself? 
Do you know how many billions of dollars were stolen under the guise of energy companies with government grants and contracts that were no-bid contracts steered to them by Congress itself? But we don't have a Prate Bahara here in San Francisco. We don't have a U.S. attorney who will look into the cozy relationship between politicians and their relatives who have made billions of dollars on these green scams. If we did, you might see some action, but we don't. It's a closed shop on the West Coast. It may as well be its own country, a nation unto itself, with no laws and no bylaws. It's a nation of greed, nothing but greed, and nothing but propaganda, day and night. And so we'll talk about all these topics, as well as the music I'm playing. Because the music summarizes what I'm trying to say to you, which is, when the music, when music lost its soul, which it did, as a result of some of the reasons some of the callers made, when music lost its soul in America, everything else lost its soul around about the same time. It's not just that music no longer has soul in it. What movie have you seen that has any soul in it? Don't tell me you cry because you saw a dog, a furry dog story. I'm not talking about having your, jerking your emotions around. I'm talking about that indefinable, that indefinable, um, element in any work of art, which is called soul. Either it has it or it doesn't. And it's, there's no way to define it. There is a Spanish word that I was told 30 years ago means soul. Duende. It refers to soul, whether it's in a painting. Why are some paintings flat and some paintings have depth to them or what you might say soul? Why is it that some, anything in the world of art, soul or no soul? In the world of politics, there's no soul. Can you name one politician who looks like he's real or she's real? Can you look at any one of them and tell me you feel as a human being there telling you anything that's real? No. Okay, so now that comes down to here we are. You're listening to me for one reason. You know that I have a mind like a steel trap. You know that I have the best analytical mind in America. You also know that I try to get to the truth on every issue. And you also know that if I feel that it's not, you know, the way I think it should be, I'll tell it to you. It's coming from a real place. People who listen to me say, ah, oh, they like the fact that Teddy the dog barks in the background and that they know it's not a can show. Well, that's true. It's, he barks in the background. Right now, thank God, he's sleeping on his mat, half sun, uh, just relaxing. He's like the master's voice, like the RCA Victor dog, listening to the program. And when I get too agitated and too worked up, he jumps up off that thing, and I don't like doing that to him. So I promise I won't do it to you either. I'll let you sleep while you listen to me. Because it's after Thanksgiving and before Christmas. And since it's the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, I really don't want to waken you from your slumber. Because between Thanksgiving and Christmas, most Americans go to sleep. Most Americans are like the big fat turkeys that they just ate. They want to go on autopilot. And can you blame us? Can you blame the average woman or the average man out there who has so much to do in the holiday season? with family and friends, what do they want to eat their hearts out over something they can not control? The answer is they don't. It's that simple. So they don't want to get worked up over politics right now. They'd rather have a warm and fuzzy couple of weeks, drift into the holidays, and then worry about politics when they have to worry about politics, which is exactly how the gangsters get away with robbing us day and night. They know very well when you're asleep, and it's when you're asleep that they come in the middle of the night like thieves and try to rob you of more taxation. So now let's listen to one of the grandest thieveries, one of the greatest thieves in the history of the world. In clip number four, I think you'll recognize the voice. I have long believed that the most elegant way to drive innovation and to reduce carbon emissions is to put a price on it. Um, this is okay, a let's stop uh, right there. Class when you hear the word elegant, when you hear the word elegant way, that's a San Francisco phrase that comes out of uh, the university crowd. Elegant. That used to be a phrase used in science 30 years ago. Now it's finally dribbled down to the gangsters from Chicago. They, they have a mouthpiece. Put a price on it. Tax it, in other words. It's so crazy if you even understood what carbon is. Now, one of the world's great experts on carbon, as you know, is Al Sharpton. We have a great... Robert, you've got to find that speech from about a month ago. We're one of the most illiterate, dumb things on the earth, but very, very shrewd in getting away with murder gave a speech on carbon that I couldn't believe what I was listening to. This Al Sharpton has gone in and out of the White House, I don't know, a couple of hundred times. You know, birds of a feather flock together, as they say. And he came out about a month ago, two months ago, and he was an expert suddenly on climate. This uh, reverend, no one knows where he got his reverend's degree from, probably a crackerjack box somewhere, but he's an expert now on carbon. 
And he gave a speech along the lines of this. That carbon is a pollution, that uh, toxic pollution that affects minorities more than anyone else. That's what passes for politics and science in Obama's America. I'm just paraphrasing. It was probably below that level, the actual statement itself. Now, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that, you know, you really ought to educate yourself on this whole subject. Okay, the subject today is, now, of course, we're not focused on terror anymore, because Obama took your mind off it. In fact, all of the cowardly world leaders took your mind off the real problem, which is the rise of Hitler again. Hitler in a headscarf. He speaks Arabic now, and he's not marching to the Horst Vessel song. He's marching to a different tune, and he's not reading Mein Kampf. He's reading a different book. But instead of focusing on the new Hitlers, we're, we're focused now on carbon. Your greatest threat now is carbon. It's not the new Hitlers in a headscarf. That's what they've decided to do. To distract you from their rotten, stinking, cowardly failures, they want you focused now on carbon. That's what they're doing. That's all they're doing. You know and I know that's not the greatest threat to our survival, carbon. First of all, on the face of it, if you want to talk about pollution and warming, you don't talk about carbon. That has nothing to do with it whatsoever. It's a wrong metric. This whole issue of carbon dioxide is the wrong metric to begin with. How many times have I told you, if you went so far even as the fifth grade, if you got as far as the fifth grade in science, which is doubtful that anyone in Congress ever even went that far in science, if you studied carbon dioxide, you know it's actually a beneficial gas. Because it was because of the large amounts of carbon dioxide that permitted plant life to grow. And as you well know, plant life is what we rely upon. It's the basis of our entire food chain. So what would you like to do, go back before the Cretaceous era? Would you like to go back before there was plant life on Earth and eliminate all carbon dioxide? What do you want to have on the Earth right now, a, a, a global cooling? It's so preposterous, it's almost impossible to discuss, but I have a whole chapter on it in Government Zero, of course. That's right, in my, in my great book. But the most important piece of data which you can get without buying my book is just Google the Vostok Ice Core Sample, V-O-S-T-O-K, I don't expect the average listener to do so. And you'll find out what I'm talking about. You will see that there have been global, there have been cooling and warming and warming and cooling phases throughout man, throughout Earth's history, forget man's history. Long before man was on the Earth, you had global warming and you had global cooling on and on and on. And so, what am I arguing for? Pollution? No, I've worked against pollution my whole, my whole life. I've tried to save rainforests in the real world as opposed to Obama who has never spent the nickel of his life dedicated to saving any of the plant life of the earth as I have I've done more than most of the environmentalists in this field and I know what I'm talking about so I want to give you one fact that is a very inconvenient uh, a statistic and here it is uh, here it is 325,000 years ago global temperatures and carbon dioxide levels were higher than they are today. Let me repeat that. 325,000 years ago, global temperatures and CO2 levels were higher than they are today. And what I wrote on page 240 is, I guess Barack Obama didn't get any of this when he was at Columbia, learning how to become a community organizer. And then, of course, I, I state what's, uh, what's obvious. We are right now near the end of another warm interglacial. And those of us who are educated even in the rudiments of science know that we're actually heading into another glacial cooling period where global temperatures will drop and ice will again form heavily at the poles. It's already happening. The Antarctic has just had the greatest growth of ice in a very long period of time. Don't take my word for it. Research it yourself. So, again, look up the Vostok ice core samples, or if you have my book, Government Zero, see page 239, what the scientists did was they drilled down into the ice above Lake Vostok in Antarctica to a depth of 10,000 feet. That's two miles down into the earth. And who did it? French and Russian scientists. And they pulled up deep core samples. And what did they look at in the deep core? They looked at, among other things, the history of temperature and carbon dioxide over the past 420,000 years. And what did I tell you? They found that 325,000 years ago, global temperatures and CO2 levels were higher than they are today. Now, there's a lot more evidence about this. But I will tell you that the biggest science scandal ever is emerging right in front of your eyes. It is the biggest science scandal ever. Now, interestingly enough, I begin the chapter Zero Science 
with a story about a previous science scandal 